If it, worked, <laughs> if it worked for Logan McCree, I suppose it can work for me. Well, and we're live. I didn't mean starting, for that to. And we're starting on that note of Logan McCree as being right for me. Uh, I was to say, like, it'd be a shame if you started live and all, and you missed that completely awesome and totally organic rhyme. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> unfortunately got cut off. So, hello everyone. Hello, chat. Good evening. Good evening, my glorious <laughs> viewers and chats. So yeah, we're not we're not doing this traditionally. Or we're kind of ad hocking it because we got a copyright strike, and I didn't realize this till last night. And our um, guest, uh, Lord of Cancer or Jewish Pie Guy, whichever one we're going with, is here. Lord so, of Jewish like, Cancer. Oh, he's yelling. Yeah, we can't hear you. Uh oh, we can't hear him. The silence. It's deafening. Anyways, we all know our favorite feline is here. Our cat's gay. Hello, Hi. everyone. So, I, what have you been up to, content-wise? Oh, uh, Prince is here. Oh, Prince is yeah. here. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> I, I'm. You okay? Yeah, I just have to. Uh, um. Uh. By the way, we are live, so don't don't disclose to anything too personal. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I, okay. I, just, I just tweeted that, so don't don't um. Don't get too sorted if you don't want to. <laughs> and remember, my yeah. channel is a PG-7 Christian channel. <laughs> uh-huh. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely sure. <laughs> so, oh, God damn it. Night. We had Lord of Cancer. He will be back, hopefully. Why I, where do I go to... Uh, night light. Ah, that's what I need to do. My um, I somehow set my night light setting to go on, and so now my uh, 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 ah, uh, uh, there we go. And yeah, all my my screen looks all weird, and it's bugging me out, man. Uh, turn off now. Ah, there we go. Ah, it's like actually a real computer. So um, how how long have we been on, on air? Like a Just a game. minute. Okay, well, then, uh, are you a man, are you a gay man, blah, 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 or something. Um, <laughs> so, Best monologue ever. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, what was I going to... Okay. Well, I, I just I I, I, did, I, did, uh, I had to have my head sorted to uh, be on on air. So, um. Uh, I, I I hope that Lord of Cancer comes back because uh, the big the big hot buzz topic, and I'm going to be making a video on it. And I actually honestly might try to get it done tonight instead of uh, playing video games, which is what I sort of like normally do at the end of the day. Um, I am wanting to make a video about the Kanye West situation, and the the subject is going to be um, a gay man's defense of Con Kanye West. Because I don't know if you guys remember this, but this was actually a really big deal in the music industry. Um, in 2005, Kanye West did an uh, interview. And, and, you know, 2005, that was when it was like, it, 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 it wasn't, it might have been cool in urban meccas to be cool with gay guys, but it wasn't like nationally popular that you're like supposed to be okay with gay guys you, you, it was still like totally socially acceptable in most high schools and everything to just like constantly make fun of gay guys and um a lot of this had to do with hip-hop culture hip-hop culture dominated uh the late 90s and the early 2000s in most places and hip-hop culture was sort of this culture of bullies and uh masculinity um in in this kind of like dumb way uh, can we call it no homo culture yeah kind of yeah and um kanye west spoke out against that in a interview on mtv and he was like talking about how um, because of the fact that hip-hop culture was like that, he ended up becoming homophobic accidentally without really thinking about it. And then he found out later that his uh, cousin, um, that his cousin was gay and that he was like, wait, maybe I'm, am I homophobic to my cousin? And so he was like, I think that we really need to stop that as, as hip hop community. He was, and he came out and like said that, you know, when he was like a, a big rapper, you know, and, <laughs> That slowly but surely ended up kind of changing everything because hip hop was the most homophobic aspect of our culture. And 
hip hop, I mean, it's not entirely unhomophobic, it, but it largely, like, if you talk to cool hip hop people, they largely don't hate hate gay guys and, and certainly not in the, in the way that they used to like they, they 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 accept the fact that like there are cool gay guys out there and that that they should at least pretend to like not hate gay guys and it was because of kanye west coming out and he was the one who had the like b- breakthrough moment of an epiphany that um that he could just say wait why do we have to be like this you know like don't most of us got like a gay cousin or something and then things started to change. And so I think that people need to give him some respect. Now, granted, uh, he did seem a little bit crazy talking to Donald Trump. Um, he did say some things that were like, oh, OK, uh, huh. uh, but um, what I wanted to talk to, um, in, uh, I guess, uh, Bacon and um, uh, the, the other guy, uh, Lord of Cancer, Jewish bi guy, whatever we call him, um, he you guys are younger and so i want to ask your opinions about like how you perceive hip-hop culture and um whether or not it's anti-gay that type of thing because i i know for a fact that there's way more like gay and queer rappers than there were te- uh 13 years ago back when um he when he made that speech about homosexuality um uh being completely uh, despised in the hip hop community. Hello. Into that. Hello. Hi. Hello. We hear you now. Yeah. Good. So, um, yeah, you know, uh, I, what I want to, I'll just sort of repeat the question. <laughs> it's just um, uh, I really want to know. Um, so I remember 13 years ago very, very well. That was when I was very, very active going out to clubs and music and everything. And you could, oh, it was rare to find a large amount of hip hop being played at a gay bar. Like it was unusual. Uh, uh, they still whereas, do play hip hop. No, 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 no. Now they do all the time. But it Unfortunately. used to Well, it used to be that they didn't at all. And the reason why was because hip hop was so incredibly homophobic and every gay guy uh, associated hip hop with homophobia. And the reason that changed is because of Kanye West. Is because in in 2005, right when Kanye West was first becoming really, really popular and everybody, and he was like a household name, he went on um, MTV and he gave a speech about homophobia and how hip hop culture sort of subconsciously trains everybody to be homophobic. It, it was hip hop culture that was saying, "Oh, that's gay. That's gay. Why that? You know, that's that that song's gay." And um, and, and, and then. Uh, he realized that he, um, you know, he, he, his 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 cousin was gay, and he was like, "Wait, does that mean that I'm homophobic to my cousin? Because I love my cousin." And he started like tearing tearing up. He was like kind of crying, and um, he, he, and he actually even had one of those like Kanye Kanye West moments where he felt like some guy <laughs> off stage was trying to get him to stop talking, and he was like, "Yo, yo, yo, let me finish, let me finish," and like you know, he's like good that. at doing that. You know what they used to play that I still wish they did play. What at all the gay clubs they used to blast Euro dance like all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they still did that. Yeah. yeah, not so much with the Euro dance as you can ask Space Band about that. It's it is much missed. I miss '90s early techno. It was so well back when it was called techno. <laughs> it's a like that's that's how I'm dating myself. Like I call it techno because I used to think that all EDM was just techno. I wasn't well, aware that it was an actual genre. Well, that was actually a thing, kind of like in the, <laughs> the United States. Most people just thought of like all house and techno and trance and everything as just sort of uh, techno. And also a lot of the early stuff, like the the ravey stuff. Um, it's it's hard to actually classify. Like I have old records where it, you wouldn't know whether to call it house or trance or techno. Like you just wouldn't. You would, I I would just call it like rave. Um, no, as far as I know, no one even listens to trance anymore. That, that was oh my no, thing. no, you know what's weird about it? Um, in the actual the scene that was the. the <laughs> the actual like techno scene like the uh, official like you know where it was like dark and like you know no trace of any sort of human element in it at mm-hmm. all like mm-hmm. three like 
three, three, four years ago, and they thought that they were really cool, except for it was really boring, and it was like, oh my god, you guys, this is the most boring music ever. Like, oh my god. Well, those fucking people, like those people that a lot of them, uh, they, they all moved to Berlin and shit. I knew a lot of them. Like, I, I know a lot of these people, and they all wanted to move to Berlin or actually did move to, to Berlin, and they're still in Berlin. Well, the big craze over there is trance. Trance is the um, thing. Oh, I, yeah, I, I love all degenerates. I, I love trans, but it's just one of the, I I never felt so old as when I was talking to this twenty year old kid, and he was talking about he wanted to be a DJ, and we were talking about different music, and I said, oh yeah, like Paul that I love Paul Van Dyke, and he's like who, and I was like, you know, like Paul Oakenfold, and he's like who, and I'm like oh my god, either you're, you're in Tiesto, <laughs> I know, but I, I, I was it was Oakenfold that threw me for a loop. I said like he was like the guy for like what a thousand years or something like that like every movie had what had to have like some sort of oakenfold remix well, in it and now no one even remembers him the thing about him was is that like he had this one cd <clears throat> called uh transport um and it was a dj mix that was uh a trance mix that was released internationally that somehow you know, like it, it, you didn't even have to find it at the import store, which which that's a thing that young kids don't understand about like the late 90s and even the early 2000s. It was hard to get a, a European electronic dance music. Like in the pre-internet to, era, yeah, yeah, you had to like go to the right record store and, or hear it on the radio at like three in the morning. Well, yeah, I and mean, like I don't know, record it, but like you, yeah, you go to the right record store. Some, somehow you figure out what it was, and then you try to try to like hope that you can find a, an import of that has it on it, and the import will cost like it'll be like a double cd set and it would cost like 30 dollars or something like some like mm -hmm. absurd amount of money and 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 once back in the day 30 dollars was like a decent amount of money too it was more it was worth more you know like that was a thing it was it's more like 50 dollars on legs yeah. today yeah 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 for a record or for a whole album still kind of outrageous even today i mean like what's one going for like 15 now it it just yeah, it, it, in the pre MP3 generation, like here here we are a bunch of like old like t we're techno seniors now. Yeah, like, so, the before, store is. I've been to them. I used to uh, yeah. Them yeah, only because you know about vintage things. Like Prince and I are complaining about, like you know, having dial-up modems, and when MP3s were this newfangled thing. Have you yeah, heard I of the Napster? I was speaking of MP3. I had the last generation of a Walkman. Oh wow, the Walkman! Yeah, I, I love that thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember the Walkman. Me. I, when I was down in, sorry. when I was down in Florida, I actually dragged it into the water with me, like the ocean water with me, so it was forever ruined. It died the way it lived on the edge. I, I missed. I missed that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like it's insane. Yeah, like I miss actually... being able to carry around like. My messenger phone, the camera, and my MP4. I, I miss doing that. So I, oh, now it's having like all the different devices. Way. Yeah, it was so much more simple than it is now because everyone's so addicted to their smartphones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, yeah. I remember, like I remember having like a, like, a CD Walkman from when I, until I was like eleven, and going to like Tower Records and finding records because you know that was the big trip going to you know Santa Rosa uh, to see the Tower Records and. A Jewish by guy. You, I worked you, at Tower Records. You, you, mm -hmm. Jewish by guy, you're a little bit too close to the microphone when you when you exhale. It sounds like a thunderstorm. Well, there, there kind we of is. It's kind of windy out. Oh, 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 oh you're outside. Okay, but just no, letting you know. Outside. Uh, so, inside. but okay. So the thing is that people. I actually did a history, <laughs> uh, sort of a, a history of gay nightlife on my channel, and I um I should I should I should cut out just that portion of the scene. Uh, I didn't really, uh, actually, Cats. I think you're making some noise. Hmm? I think that, okay. Yeah, yeah, the, the noise is Cats. God damn it. <laughs> now that he's muted. Um, so, the, I, I did, like, a sort of, a, like, a brief his history of gay, gay nightlife on my main channel, um, which, uh, in a stream with my friend Yosef, and um, it probably went on for like uh, a half hour or maybe 40 minutes when I actually was going through all the stuff. I was like showing a lot of pictures 
Um, but one of the things I didn't really do is go into specific detail about like 90s club music and um, last decade club music because I actually know a considerable amount about it. And the thing is, is that like through the 90s, it, 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 I, I wasn't able to go to gay clubs, but uh, due to hip hop and also sort of punk rocks, not so much punk rocks. There, there was cool punk rockers who were cool with gay guys. Like it was sometimes like cool and edgy to be like, you know, it, it, it was knowing a homosexual a form of punk rebellion in of itself. Yeah, yeah, like enough. Like there, I mean, but there would be guys that were like anti-gay. Like, but then there would be like another guy who would be like, "Don't fuck with my gay friend, I'll beat your ass." Like, it was like this weird thing. Um, it, Before it they kind of, devolved into the endless competition about who was the poser. Oh no, that was always there. Oh, <laughs> they, they, they never. They, there was that, never a moment when somebody wasn't being called a poser. It, um, it's an essential part of punk culture: is the the cyclical mantra of who is the poser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but okay. So, the, I think that because of the hostility of the punk scene and the hip hop scene and the metal scene, and you know, like um, everybody, all the gay guys sort of <laughs> gravitated towards. I mean, like disco had always been a very gay thing, and that kind of evolved into um, house music and techno music in like, um, like. Uh, Detroit and in uh, Chicago, uh, and 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 then there was also like in New York there was all sorts of different types of music. Like they, they sort of called it garage at the, at the time, but it was essentially like, like a lot like house music and 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 disco it evolved. But it got bigger in Europe, and um, in Europe they actually had what they called the summer of love was the um, sort of like the when the rave scene exploded in Manchester and they were having all sorts of field parties like every weekend and everybody was on like, you know, six ecstasy and no, 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 like six hits of it, like just like massive quantities, you know, until like the, 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 the next evening they would finally come down, you know, and, then, and this was pre Molly where like a lot of the times it was like mixed with amphetamines half the time, even if just small amounts. No, I, I think it might have actually been mostly pure Molly. Um, I don't know. I don't uh, actually, I, I just don't know because that, that, there's no, no, this was in 1980. The summer of love was 1989. I don't know at what time Molly became widely accessible. I just remember hearing about, I don't even remember hearing about Molly until, I don't know, like maybe five years ago. It seemed like it, like when I was still, you know, vaguely going to raves, everyone was always talking about ecstasy and it seemed to yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, okay, no, okay. So, so you're getting things mixed up. This is what happened. MDMA was um, invented in the eighties. Um, maybe in the late seventies, but it like didn't actually hit, you know, it didn't become a street drug until the eighties and they started making music kind of um, geared to be for people that were high on, on it. And it was MDMA and that is the same chemical as pure Molly. And granted, it's not like that was the only thing that they were doing 110%, you know, like I'm sure like maybe they would mix it with other things, but that was the backbone of what they were doing starting in um, like the summer of love in Manchester and all through the early nineties. Like if you go and look at some of the crap that they were playing, um, like, okay, there's a, a band called the shaman that has music videos that you can watch. Um, the, the 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 good one is the song Forever People. That's that's a good song. Forever People by the Shaman, and then they have a song called Ebe Ebenezer Good. And the song Ebenezer Good, he goes, "Ease are good, ease are good, he's Ebenezer Good." And it's it's a kind of like a coded way thing of uh, he's saying, "Ease are good, ease are good," but they he disguised it by saying like talking about a, a man named Ebenezer Good. And, but then you hear it enough times and you're like, wait, he's saying E's are good, E's are good. It's very strange. He's an, and it's an actual like British guy who's rapping in um, to like a techno beat really, really fast, but he's not actually like hip hop style rapping. He's just like talking really fast. And um, so that was how that culture developed over there. And I mean, ecstasy is just this weird thing where it makes people completely ridiculous. And I actually went to a British rave in, uh, like about uh, the year 2001 
and like a, a bunch of straight people walking around in like uh like it'll be like straight guys uh-huh. walking around in like Daisy Dukes and like binkies and shit like just like looking fucking ridiculous trip like totally rolling on like X- I don't miss the binkies. <laughs> Well, no, but there was a purpose for them. It was because if you take a bunch of ecstasy, you grind your jaw, and you you want to chew on your lips or like bite your teeth off, and so like that's why they had them. And so I, I remember. I've, yeah, I've I've seen the type of ridiculousness that British people get up to when they take a bunch of um, MDMA, and so when you're like that, like you don't really care about who's gay or who's straight. Like that's not like you, you just start touching each other, like you know. Um, oh yeah, it's, it, I I may have no, I definitely didn't come for any men that just wanted it, tactile stimulation. Yeah, so so that's what the music was like over there, and that music ended up becoming what was popular all through the '90s. Was this like thunk 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 and then you know like the the trance with the like pretty vocals and stuff like that gay guys really liked that it was it was non-threatening and it didn't remind them of the assholey hip-hop people like the, the the people who were mean or like the abrasive punk rock music which like some some gay guys like kind of liked but at the same time it was really abrasive so 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 pretty much entirely like all through the 90s all you heard was stuff that was essentially like European <clears throat> dance music. And that ended up maintaining its mainstay through the early 2000s, but by probably around 2003, 2004 was when things started to change. And that's when things, um, when uh, a lot of it actually changed in the neighborhood that I was living in, like literally Williamsburg, Brooklyn, was the neighborhood that was the first like hipster neighborhood to really be in Brooklyn because it was the closest to Manhattan in New York and Manhattan is where all of the skys- skyscrapers are and um, you can take a train that'll it'll take about 10, 10, 10 15 minutes to get from Manhattan to Brooklyn and they started having a, a few gay gay nights in Brooklyn and the biggest one which wasn't officially a gay night actually but it was like the the, the, <laughs> the DJs were all gay and I, I actually know one of them still this guy named uh, Spencer product um, and uh, the head of it was a man named Larry T. Larry T produced the um, electronic part of Supermodel by RuPaul. Oh, I, I love that song. Yeah, and so I would go said to this- every gay man everywhere within a hundred miles, <laughs> and, and and they don't and they don't even know why. Yeah, no, it's such a fun how song. Can you, how, how can you hate RuPaul? Yeah, well, and, 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 if you have no soul, and, and that, that came. <laughs> <laughs> that's true well, okay, that song that song came out when i was about like 11 or 10 or something maybe maybe 12 and it was on like mtv <laughs> like it was and it was like what is this is this you know <laughs> and, and me being a little kid i'm like i don't think that that's actually a woman am, am i the only one <laughs> like you know um and um and, and but i but i had a gay guy living in my house who was this like gay theater guy and so he kind of explained what rupaul was to me and um i wanted to hate on it except for secretly i liked it and he was like no 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 it's great i bet you like it and i was like well maybe kind of <laughs> you know? don't tell me what i like <laughs> um, and okay so that larry t had in in the, uh in the early 90s he had made a uh, supermodel by rupaul he had worked in the gay club scene and he had been uh djing electro and stuff like that since the 1980s and in the early 2000s he started um this night that was a regular night called it was uh, it was in williamsburg brooklyn and he called it berliniumsburg and it, it because the reason why was because a lot of um there was this new movement of um kind of like punk rock electro like stuff like mm. a really really early miss kitten and chicks on speed and uh fisher spooner a really early fisher spooner 
And now, just to be sh- clear, these are actual groups, not just people performing unusual acts that you're describing, like it, kicks it, on speed and. So yeah, that's a, yeah. It's a, it's it's a it's a it's a band. Um, <laughs> so and uh, so there was like and, and these were like these really really um, the thing is about them was that the early Fisher Spooner was actually pretty well produced because. Uh, um, uh, oh yeah, I remember them. <laughs> Yeah, but but the other ones like Chicks on Speed and um, the early Miss Kitten stuff when she was working with this guy called the Hacker, it was actually really poorly produced music. It was very, it was like just a drum machine, a little bit of a synth line, and then a vocal. But what was cool about it was it it it, 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 it was it was electronic music that rejected because like by the end of the nineties and the early in the early two thousands, electronic music had really really high production standards. Like you had to be a really good producer for your record to get played at any of the clubs. But these people were just making basically like punk rock electronic music where it was like. Uh, well, I'll just make a really shitty electronic record, but I'll do it with a cool attitude. Oh, and Peaches, early, early Peaches was like this. Um, and so it was very kind of like stylistic minimalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it was a rejection of mainstream electronic music. And so that there was the regular club night that played that music. And a lot of the, <sighs> the, the New York, it was almost like a moment in time shared between berlin and new york city and it was it really only went on for like a year and a half that it was like actually hot and then and then it um and then the guy the the guy who produced um uh rupaul uh his name was larry t and he coined the genre he called the genre he he made up a name for it and Mm. he called he called it electro clash and almost as soon as he actually named it, everybody said, oh, it's over. It's stupid. It's done. It's finished. And, the, and everybody hated him and act like he like he like uh, people in New York have, ha, uh, especially last decade. Um, but but I guess, you know, in the 80s, they were really like this, too. They have a tendency to like um, act like they, they want to have the newest, freshest trend. And then as I soon as I gotta go to bed now, unfortunately, I have four oh. fucking nine a.m. Saturday. Oh, okay. Well, don't worry about it. We'll we'll talk to you later. I really don't want to go to my shitty job. Yeah, it is one of the classic questions in life: to go to the shitty job or to have no shitty money. True. <laughs> it's a hard world out there, and it's expensive. <laughs> Shitty money for that shitty walk. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Hello, she's like, oh, shitty chicken, have it. She wants to say chicken, shitty chicken. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Shitty pork, shitty pork. All right, see you later. Well, that was an ignominious and unfortunate end. Yeah, yeah. But I'm sure. But I'm sure he'll be back with more ignominy than ever before. Oh, by the way, uh, Liberal Hammer will sh- should be joining us in a few minutes, from what I understand. Yeah, I saw that. Mm-hmm, I it was there. I know everything. Mm, the, bacon, the bacon has infiltrated every aspect of our society. It knows its intelligence is unstoppable, as are its salty comments. Actually, um, I, I'm just Polish, I know things. Mm, ah! <laughs> But what if you? What if the only thing you knew were Polish jokes? Yeah, that's like, not true. Um, we're Polish. We know things about that. We mean we're gossips. <laughs> ah, you see, yeah, that 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 the, is that uh, essential aspect of Polishness, pretending to be wise when really you're just gossipy. Yeah, um, there's a reason why there's no terrorist attacks in Poland. That's because every grandmother is looking out on her porch and everything. In the uh, d- 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 they, they've been unable to penetrate the Polish intelligence network of babushkas. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or, yeah, or, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what, what, bachas? Bacha. 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 The yes. Bacha network. It's just too dense. It's too, its responses are too. And now with grandchildren and text messaging and video evidence, like the Bachas are everywhere. Mm-hmm. If, if only, the, let's see, I, I don't know. It's if, if only we had the botches to take down Al Qaeda back in the day, that would have been something. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm back. We're just talking about how apparently Polish grandmothers are very, very gossipy enough to where they can rival the CIA and other intelligence networks, which is why there's never been a Polish terrorist attack. 
So, um, uh, I, I, I get it. That's funny. <laughs> so I got this caramel milk and it is so good. Oh my God. Um, Car- caramel milk. Yeah. Like chocolate milk, but it's caramel. Ooh. It yeah, is good. I, there's a, there's been a great, uh, push throughout the food industry to start, uh, making attractive non-chocolate options as the price of cacao continues to rise. The, did you know that in about, uh, I think they say in 20 years or so, it's hyper, it's hyperbolic, but in 20 years, they say that chocolate will cost um, about two or three times as much as it does now. Well, the good thing is for an American, at least, like the good or the bad thing is that we don't generally, we don't really eat a lot of chocolate in America. Even when we think we are eating chocolate, it's usually... Uh, corn syrup with uh, <laughs> with food dye, and sometimes uh, oh yeah, with carob or carob. Yes, oh, thank okay. God for the carob plant. What? Oh, I thought I, oh yeah, that's right. I said caribou. Wrong, wrong, wrong kind of thing. The the caribou. It's it's because of caribou that we have, <laughs> that we have a reliable chocolate substitute. <laughs> oh, that is the oh, that is the most horrific thing I have ever contemplated. I don't, I, I have well, no words. Be, I, I, that would not be vegan friendly. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So, so, you guys, I was in the middle of a, a history history thing. Oh, um, yes. Uh, continue uh, with the with the '90s. He was he had just been almost excommunicated because New Yorkers are incredibly fashionistic. Well, this was this was technically in the early 2000s, and this was about 2000. Oh, okay. This was 2003 or so. He, um, uh, okay, we can hear all of your breath. It's really loud. Okay, so um, he had been um, – what was his deal? Uh, 2003, um, Electro Clash became huge. And I think that what kind of happened was that because of the fact that his night, which he had coined the phrase Electro Clash to describe the night Berliniumsburg, um, it got a lot of attention around New York City, and it brought over the – Manhattan fashion-y crowd and previously it had just been this kind of like Brooklyn hipster thing and then it was like all these Manhattan people trying to be like they were kind of posers they were kind of coming over pretending to be all into it and like the fact of the matter is that they they weren't really like they didn't really know anything about it they didn't really know the Brooklyn people they didn't really know the Brooklyn scene and then they started moving over and you know I ended up moving over there like in 2003 actually the same time period and I was a college kid and, and it became the place to live for like college age hipsters because it was uh, it was cheap enough to live over, right in that area and um Brooklyn. As opposed to the skinny jeans. Yeah. So what had, what, what kind of, well, no, we, we were all wearing skinny jeans. Like that was what we were wearing. Um, <laughs> that was how it was. Um, so what, you arrived at Brooklyn and you got a pair of skinny jeans at the bus station, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is what happened. Um, after the, the electro clash thing was declared over like it was like you were you were no longer supposed to be into electro clash anymore and it was because electro clash like grew up it became too huge it brought over all the manhattan people blah 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 then everybody said well you know what's really cool is actually the williamsburg brooklyn um art rock scene and that was bands like um the yeah yeah yeah's and the liars I and, love the yeah yeah yeahs. Yeah, the yeah yeah yeahs were actually good. Like they actually Karen O oh is she her voice is really quite stunning. Well, and the, actually all of them, all three of the like main staples of the band. Like I think they've worked with a few other people um but it's the the Zim, Zin, Zinner guy um he um he tends to compose uh, most of the music. He, he plays guitar and keys. Uh, he grew up re- um, recording with four-track stuff. And then the drummer is actually really talented. If you listen to their old recordings, he's a really kick-ass drummer. And they were able to just like play shows. Um, I don't know how their shows originally were, but like people really, really liked that because they were just like, they could actually just play a really, really good song or set the three of them in some like random you know, loft space in Brooklyn back when Brooklyn was really cheap right in that area. And so they got popular doing that. And um, 
there was other bands that were like that. And so Brooklyn then became this like big, um, kind of like art rock, uh, place and then but then the hipster scene like also branched out into like arty arty hipster hip-hop like mia was one of the, the first really big artists that was like that um they were the ones that had that kind of fun but then really played out song where the girl was singing through some sort of weird staticky filter and they kept talking about shooting people she's like all i want to do is on a oh uh, yeah that that's exactly what i thought thank Take you your the, money. The, yeah 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 that was that was the, 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 the um, ear the ear cancer does, does anyone have any chemo yeah no that song is actually not even that good she had a lot of other better songs if you actually got into her um it, it was she, good the first 300 times or so yeah it was annoying it got really annoying but um um it was produced by diplo and diplo became a really really big um electronic uh act uh by himself He's pretty cute too. He's um you should you should take a look at like he he'd be like if oh and they were dating for a while too. They must have been like the best that must have been the best sex ever because um MIA was a pretty hot girl too. Um she was like this like she was like Sri Lankan or something, but she was she was cute. Like um, no, no, she was where they got the idea to make the movie Teeth, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that movie. I, I'm such a terrible person. You, you never, you never saw Teeth. No, no. Do you know oh, about God. it? No. Don't, don't. Oh, uh, yeah. It is. I, all oh. I will say about it is that it is actually the one of the worst movies ever made. Um, but you, you think it's going to be bad just because, well, of the of the premise. But it's so much worse than you think it is like it's it's actually so bad that it becomes like a transcendental experience so are you saying it's a good bad movie I mean, um right? no I mean, well you know how some well i'm gonna say it's the movie that rises to the level of drinking game or personal meme um oh, yeah oh, you could definitely Def- oh, it would, oh, oh that would yes. be such a it would be a, a wonderful terrible drinking game it's oh, let's God, put this yes. Let's put it this way. It's on a level of cringe, almost equivalent to the human centipede, without being quite as disgusting. What's great with that video is actually you need like a group of guys watching it. And every time the guy cringes or every time you're a guy who cringes or like puts your legs together, you have to take a shot because there's this one, the one scene where, you know, she bites it off her Uh off and drops it on the floor and the dog eats it. I'm like, oh. Yeah, that is I, like... <laughs> it's yeah, that that would you know those challenges they have on YouTube like try to watch this without yeah. laughing or something. Try to watch uh, teeth without cringing. <laughs> and the the other the other more extreme version of that game could be try to watch the human centipede without dying inside. <laughs> <laughs> I I personally don't think it can be done. But okay, I, okay. So that that was a, that was a little segue, but it, it, you, it, that was a good um. Inter- intermission because the story of the evolution of the the hipster scene that's sort of where it ends like it used to be it kind of started with electronic dance music then it went to electro clash then it went to rock and then and then and then hip hop was introduced and by the end of it it was just this mish- mishmash about like if you went to the right party around 2005 in Williamsburg Brooklyn you would hear some electronic music like lcd sound system which was technically electronic music but it had guitars in it and then you would also hear rock and you would also hear hip-hop music like mia and it was in 2005 and i was living in williamsburg like the uh, hipster epicenter of the world um it was in 2005 that more and more hip-hop people were starting to mix with did we lose him Oh, I don't know. He has roboted away, unfortunately. Oh. Mm. He'll come back eventually. Hold on. <laughs> oh, there he is. Um, okay, yeah, I'm back. I'm back. Okay. So I, I, I cut out for a second. Um, so more and more gay people were starting to mix with rocker people and electronic people and hip hop people. It, it just became this big um, hodgepodge of all these different things by 2005, just due to this like natural evolution. And then finally Kanye came out with the interview saying that hip hop culture was homophobic and he wants to, he's like, man, 
I've been there. I'm not about that life. My cousin is gay. And he started like uh, crying on the MTV interview and it changed everything. It changed everything. Not overnight. The easy not, factor. Not, not overnight, but he was the first big star at hip hop to be like, why we got to just hate gay people? It's dumb. And then like more and more hip hop artists were like, I guess you're kind of right. Yeah, I don't. I don't really hate gay people. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it was Kanye who introduced the gay strain into hip hop, and its assimilation <laughs> was complete over the course of ten years. And now, resistance is futile. You will know the gays. So and, the gay Borg that needs to <laughs> We are the Gorg. <laughs> so moral, moral of the story. Moral of the story, and then I'll shut up for a second. Is that like? It's easy to you know like look at him in the White House saying some kind of like certifiably wacky sounding things like he he at one point says like you you try to tell me that donald trump is a racist and i say what you think that's gonna stop me that is an invisible wall i'm gonna get past that and it's like okay i think i i think i know what you're like trying to get at but that was not the best way to like like I have to, I have to consciously think about what you're probably talking about to like actually, like you know, put that together in my mind. But um, at the same time, at the same time, what Kanye is good at, like what he successfully is did in 2005, like all, all he really did was just honestly share his real feelings. Like he was like, "Wait, my cousin's gay. I don't hate my cousin. Why do we got to act like we hate all gay people just because we're hip hop? That's dumb." But what he's doing now is like the same thing, but it's with Republicans and with Trump. And he's saying, "Why we got to hate Trump just because everyone else said that we're supposed to?" He's pulling the fir- the cards from the house, and soon the plantation will burn. Mm-hmm. The, 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 planta- the plantation being, of course, democratic orthodoxy like, and this whole I, I mean, look, it's happened to the gays. It's happening to everyone like it's. Did you guys hear about that survey that I think Tim Pool and a few others have been talking about it? Mm-hmm. Like this, this really intense, like scientific study, we shouldn't even call it a survey where they really broke everything down in the numbers. And isn't it really like it just feels so completely true and right that the number of people who are actually these crazy just shrieking like people these hardcore progressives and there's what maybe eight percent of the population like, yeah 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 the, he said it's, it's the uh, the identifiably progressive activist population is about eight percent or maybe less and uh, the, the sheer population. majority of the population does either doesn't affiliate and actively dislikes what they are about. Well, no, but, I mean, well, he said that even thirty percent of the progressive activists think that PC authoritarianism, like PC rules, are a problem. And, and it's it's just like I again coming back to my man, the Jordan, the Peterson. Like it's saying, you know, you don't need a lot of people to create an incredibly powerful effect on society. It just takes a, a small contingent of people that are loud and completely um, indifferent or even antagonistic to common social mechanics, to social rules. And people will fall in line because most people are docile and want to get along. So if you've got a crazy person in the room, people are going to act differently, even if they completely disagree with that person. Yeah, no, I, pretty, I, I think that that happened on YouTube, um, you know, uh, early in right at the beginning of the year, which was the blood sports people. Like there was no more than actually like maybe a hundred, but probably really no more than 50 people who were actually like into that. And they just inflated their numbers with massive sock puppet accounts and made a lot of noise. And that was it. <laughs> you know, like... and people people were very it, it was like the red scare only with even like even there were fewer people into that than there were actual communists in the united states during the red scare mm-hmm. like because at least there were there were actually some people somewhere but yeah, yeah but just all it takes is volume volume and indifference to consequences yeah like i mean and i'm not saying that there weren't people that would look at it like i know that there were more yeah. like they would get they would get you know some number of hundreds of people looking at it, but it was only because of that 50 people who were actually into it. 
Like the fifty, like everybody, like because I would end up watching this. Like you know, they have Allison Teeman come on. I had to watch for that. Of course, I did. I really support her. I really value her work. If she's going to get blindsided by a bunch of assholes like lying about her and saying all sorts of crazy things, of course I have to watch. Of course I have to defend her. But it was only because of those very small few bad actors that put her in that situation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were a couple of larger channels that were letting some credibility to it. And sometimes all that takes is just a couple of like one or two prominent figures and a couple of very loud people. And that's exactly what you see on the left. Like this, uh, yeah. like the Me Too film. You know, I don't, does anyone believe for a second that the Me Too movement is really that widespread? Or is it just a couple mm-hmm. of incredibly belligerent and really just unethical? Well, not all of them unethical, but basically just a couple of extremists and a lot of people who are basically afraid of being called out as not being with the extremists. Uh, I do know some people that are actually for it. And considering no, that for it. Sh- well, no, for it, are, yes. Like, but like ardently and belligerently for it that aren't exactly political. I think True. Me Too I think has more reach than you know standard intersectional bullshit. But In know. certain circles. But you have to remember also where you and I live. We live at the epicenter of craziness. Oh, no, we live are, in, you know. These are people that are scattered all over the country and some of them are actually in the suburbs yeah. of New Jersey. It's true, and I'm. I would say that. I mean, the swampy parts of New Jersey. Well, all of New Jersey is swamp. True, and I'm not. And I'm not saying that they're like that they're an insignificant number. What I'm saying though is that like what it's portrayed in media, like it's this massive uprising, and we're again like progressives. It doesn't take a lot of people in proportion to a greater population to make it appear like something massive is happening. When in reality, it's just a very, very agitated minority. Like I, yeah, I think we're the big. No, so. well, like, like I, I think like if we're gonna go with the eight percent number is the hardcore progressives. I think Me Too expands beyond that, but not that much beyond that. This is probably a lot of overlap. I mean, we can yeah. pretty much just assume it is the eight mm-hmm. percent, and maybe some people that are genuinely. You know, they think that they're on board, but that's when, before they actually – most of these people don't actually know very much. Like the vast majority of people who call themselves feminists, when you actually confront them with real feminism, they don't recognize it. They don't understand it. Yeah, and then, they dodge, and then they dodge themselves to death, and you realize that they're not even a feminist at all. Like they're just not one. But um, okay, first um, I, I need to say something really, really quick, and then I want to hear from the Liberal Hammer. I think his mic not actually be working very well, and um, because it it was hard when he he tried to speak up and it was very mumbled, but I want to say really quick, is that the 8%, uh, I think that they kind of know that they're a small but vocal minority. I think that the the hardcore leaders of them, because like the hardcore leaders are people that have their um, roots in ties to the Communist Party, and that has what has been the the consistent... um, you know layover like hand-me-down thing that's kept their little teeny activists you know like they they just retreat back to berkeley and you know like back to the gender studies department (laughs) yeah yeah and and, and it's happened to them decade after decade they like make a little push and then everybody hates them and then they're like i don't know i don't know how they even have money to like even live you know decade after decade but what they but what they're pretty clever about doing is deceptive and catchy brand marketing, which is what Black Lives Matter was. They knew that they could get the, the, the they, they knew that they could weaponize black people to be like progressive activists if they framed it in the right way. But you know, ultimately, Black Lives Matter was not about black lives at all. It was about progressive activism, but it was reframed. And the, yeah, the, they do the, have exceptionally good timing. Yeah, and and Me Too was no different. Me Too, they were they 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 knew that they could weaponize um, women in particular um, to be hardcore far leftist pro- progressive activists based on saying, "Hey, haven't you ever experienced sexual harassment or sexual assault or rape?" And like most women said, "Yes." And then they're like, mm-hmm. "Okay, so fuck those Republicans and fuck all those men in power. Let's get them." And it was a weaponization. Now, um, Liberal Hammer, uh, say something, because so, I want to know if your mic is working all right. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you sound fine. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> all right. No, um, I was going to say definitely. I mean, one of the things, especially having been an activist, mind you, I feel like I was an activist before it went completely batshit crazy, is that one thing that 
there is a skill set for there is the appearance of being bigger than you actually are. And it's an important skill. It, it is absolutely an important skill, especially with, you know, when you're trying to get a message out there, it's, especially if you're better at the social media, if you're better at, you know, uh, just just being out there and being present in general. But I, w- I will say this, and I know, Prince, you said the leaders are probably aware of this, and I know they are. It's just how small of um you know how small of a minority they are and the thing is for those who follow them who think that this is this huge wave it is all it always ends up in heartbreak because i have a lot of friends who i talk to on a regular basis and i've asked them to come on my youtube channel i've asked them to do different things and they say no you know because they don't want to get the ridicule from the far left now, what, what the far left then fails to realize, at least the average person, their leaders definitely, obvious, I think they know this, is that, yeah, they may have intimidated these people as far as, you know, public is concerned. They won't make public statements, fight, you know, um, d- you know uh, fighting their views or, you know, expre- you know, contradicting them. But when it comes to like the ballot and other decisions that they make, they speak volumes. I, you know, I, I know a number of people in my home state, Cynthia Nixon was pushed hard here in New York. And there was this outcry of her, of her losing to Andrew Cuomo because so many people seemed to be, you know, m- messaging about her and talking about her and everything. But I knew a number of people who just stepped out of it and they're like, yeah, I mean, I listen to people talk about Cynthia Nixon and I'm like, uh-huh, yeah, that's great, that's great. But they're like, uh, yeah, not voting for her. I, I'll, I'll let them believe so they don't slip out on me that I'm going to go this way so they don't flip their freaking lid. But trust me, I'm not there. And that's the, that's the big wake-up call. That That's when they get that big wake-up call is when those people speak, especially at the ballot. Do you think maybe they just all secretly wanted to vote for Kerry instead? <laughs> I, I had I had to go there because, and you know why I had to go there because that's literally the only important thing about Cynthia Nixon. She was on that TV show once. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Oh, I know the debate when I watched the debate, and I wasn't the only one to make this joke, but I actually watched the debate between Cynthia Nixon and Andrew Cuomo, and oh god, it was just a disaster. But I was like, oh, this has been the most entertaining episode of Sex in the City ever, and it was interesting though because Cynthia Nixon, Andrew Cuomo is condescending as all hell. That's one thing he definitely is, but he's better. He's he's more well spoken than Cynthia Nixon, and Cynthia Nixon, the one thing she did do. Was was every question asked of Andrew Cuomo, she would interrupt with it, interrupt him and call him a liar. Interestingly enough, she might she reminded me a little bit of Trump in her in how she kept interjecting. And there was one point though where I was like, this is this is this is this is like first grade level shit here. Where he Andrew Cuomo finally had enough and he goes to her, he, she interrupts one of his questions while he's speaking and she goes and he goes, Will you stop interrupting me? And she goes to him, I will stop when you stop lying and Cuomo responds I'll stop when you stop and I'm just like oh my <laughs> fucking god we're, the, we're spitballs involved we're spitballs did involved really, wait, did he really say I'll stop yes. when you stop yes wait, so, so, he said, so what she should have said was so you admit that you're fucking lying then yes I would have done that she didn't though Emma. she didn't though she just smirked because that's her skill set but seriously this was a platform which I don't like democratic socialism that's what she is I understand that but this is a platform for her to actually put whatever message she believes she has out there, but she spent the whole time interrupting Andrew Cuomo and not actually talking about her views. Everything wasn't an, because it's funny because everything for her was an attack on Andrew Cuomo. For Andrew Cuomo, everything was an attack on Trump. Pretty much, Andrew Cuomo. Cynthia Nixon didn't exist in this. Andrew Cuomo is already running his campaign against Trump. Cynthia Nixon, she's not actually running for governor. I think she wants to go for like mayor of New York or something. You know, mayor of New York City. I think that's her ultimate goal someday. One of the things that just happened, which I think is actually very interesting, because um, they had that little like, you know, they have the, uh, the Democratic Socialists of America party, which is actually not Bernie Sanders' party. We all thought that it like theoretically it was supposed to be but it's not it's actually just like intersectional feminism the party is, is what it is and um it's it's just full of like 
dumb women it really ultimately is what it is like it's, it's how like, dare you criticize them Ooh. no but that's exactly what they are it's like women who are are dumb and who like aren't aren't straight white women or something like you know like that's like, like that's apparently i use pronouns okay <laughs> and, um, no and i know and they got and they got pounded by the court of public opinion like immediately like as like it took them like all of three weeks for everybody to realize that they're just dumb <laughs> Like they're like really, really dumb. And so what happened, I, I think that the, the, the Democratic Party was sort of running them as a test. Like, okay, what if we actually tried to like run on this like radical leftist socialist platform? Let's let's put some actresses and this young, like cute Cortez girl up and see how long she lasts. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, Ben Shapiro fucking butt raped her. Okay, let's not. Um, <laughs> and- are, are you saying that the Democrats used democratic socialism at the same way Pepsi used Crystal Pepsi as some sort of new flavor yeah, and, kinda, kinda. and everyone hated it and now yeah. and now they just say well of course you want the original flavor what? <laughs> yeah, and, and, yeah and 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 now what's funny is that um there was just a gigantic purge on facebook of um and, and all of the like alternative media sphere or um like uh uh tim pool talks about this but you know who i'm actually who i actually like better than tim pool who is um Tim Pool, I think, looks up to. I think he thinks of him as his older brother. And I don't know why I didn't actually start watching this channel sooner. Uh, the guy from We Are Change, the blonde dude, that kind of seems like a tweaker. Oh, I'm, not, I'm, not, yeah. I'm oh. not personally familiar enough. Do you know who he is? I don't, I, don't, I don't know that guy either. Bacon? You have to share that info. Okay, no, his name is We Are Change, and he's been around for okay. um, for like I think over like I think he's like was one of the original like YouTube news channels, and um, he's like a sort of a more of a like a libertarian. Uh, oh, is he that dude that like some network like I think it uh, that one that Al Gore's like True TV like tried to make a news network out of him, but it failed because they didn't listen to him. Maybe, but um. Likely not, though, because um, he doesn't really like the Democrats. But maybe that's one of the reasons he doesn't like the Democrats. Um, he's kind of paranoid, um, a little conspiracy. Like, he's the type of guy I have a lot of respect for him in terms of the fact that he really tries to cover all of his bases and, like, what's really going on in the world and, like, what people are focused on. But, like, make sure that he knows about all of the international news that we're not focusing on. But then it's also kind of like, dude, you're biting off a little bit more than you can chew. Um, Mm -hmm. And then you get this, like, vibe where it's almost like he's a tweaker and it's like, maybe he is, you know? (laughs) But um, it's it's hard to tell, but he's really, really cool. And um, so he and his friends, he he has a show on on YouTube. And um, apparently Facebook deleted something like 800 different accounts of alternative news places and most of them are actually far left so these are the type of places that would be supporting these candidates like the democratic socialists from america facebook is purging them and i think that the reason they're doing it is to support the corporate democrats in the midterms there is also if i think you're right one of the other things that tim pool talked about which uh, i've been hearing also is the justification for this there might actually be some truth in the fact that basically they decided to get rid of these g- kind of news algorithm gerrymandering, op- not gerrymandering, jerry rigging operations where like one person will create like 50 different sites and upload like basically the same article to it and then create all this fake engagement as a way of gaming the algorithm. So it is. And it's possible that in the past, maybe if if we are putting our tinfoil hats on, that people who wanted to engage in that kind of activity were hiring these kinds of people to do that kind of thing. Yeah, maybe so, Prince. I got I got a question for you about that. Then to expand on this theory. So if there if there is now this purge, especially with the midterms coming, and you know in the future, because that that was their 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 attempt at an experiment. Do you think there's any mainstream Democrats that, while trying to pander to this experiment, uh, what what Democrats do you think just ruined themselves in who have been mainstream, who tried to appeal to that experiment and it just failed? I know, for example, in my home state, Kirsten Gillibrand 
love her. And she just, she, she, when she first was elected, she was actually called Annie Oakley. She was actually fairly moderate. She was even pro second amendment, a lot of things like that. She was, she was a decent politician. And then now she's there meeting and she has, uh, she just did an event where she was introduced by Linda Sassor. Oh, and she's, she's a monster. She, yeah, so so she went from this moderate, small town girl, Annie Oakley was her nickname uh, at one point. She was seen as very much about reaching across the aisle, very, you know, Republicans and Democrats respected her, actually. And then suddenly here she is with Linda Sassor. So yeah. I, I think I think she's damaged herself beyond repair personally, you know, as someone who yeah. well, is okay, a New York so This State is what resident. I would say about Kirsten Gillibrand. The thing you have to remember, uh, Space Pan was the one that really drilled this into my head. He's not here, but... um. Uh, Kirsten Gillibrand is the woman who created Mattress Girl. Hmm. She made Mattress Girl into a thing. She wanted there to be a national spokesperson for rape on university campus, even though it wasn't an actual epidemic. And she settled for the fucking most bizarre, dramatic public display of some, that would represent it so she was like oh perfect you're this like wacky girl carrying around a mattress for some fucking reason and then when it turned out to be fake she never even she just pretended like it wasn't fake it, <laughs> she didn't really say anything um, but the reason why Kirsten Gillibrand did that it was undoubtedly because um, she shook all, she shook hands many times with Hillary Clinton um, I mean you mm. know they, they're both from New York State they're both um, like it would almost be like if Hillary Clinton was Thanos um, Kirsten, <laughs> Kirsten Gillibrand would be the, 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 the blue one with the devil or, hair, you know, the, like, I will not fail you, uh, that, 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 oh, kept fighting, that, that kept fighting the Scarlet Witch, you know, like that, 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 that fucking bitch, that would be Kirsten <laughs> Gillibrand. <laughs> oh God, so she, the mental she, imagery. She, she's, so she's a, uh, the, not a mute, oh no. I was trying to say metahuman, but that's the wrong universe. But yeah, she's a minion. Yeah, yeah, she's like she's one of the children of, of Clinton. Chil yeah. <laughs> children of Clinton. So I know. Okay, so that's that's Kirsten Gillibrand, who for me she's definitely done. How do you feel about some of the other names do you, with with this? If if there is this purge, how do you think other politicians like Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, um, how, how they're going to fare with this? Hold on a bit, one moment. Just gotta say it, Kamala okay. Harris, fuck her while we're at it. Just, I, just <laughs> hey, yeah. Uh, so here's cool. the deal. Her, she was like the DA of, El, of Alameda County for a while, and there was a bunch of false positive drug tests because her lab tech was doing the evidence, and she's never gotten. <laughs> and, like, I, I'm not kidding you. She has never gotten called for this. No, no corruption investigation whatsoever, and like literally nobody like will talk about it. It's like this is wait, this wait, is, wait, wait, wait. How how did this work? Basically, if it, her like if like when like uh, drug evidence would get brought into like the county uh, lockup to be tested and investigated and shit, apparently the head of the lab tech was doing some of the like cocaine, and cocaine mm -hmm. is so powdery that it will literally contaminate your entire lab if any of it gets out of containment. And oh my god! And apparently, like thousands of cases had to get thrown out because some of the other tests got contaminated because of it. That oh is a straight God. abortion. That is an abortion of justice was, in the most. And, and she was the head of the fucking county department that was overseeing that shit, and she's like never been called for it. Like she got elected mm. to state attorney general like right after that happened. She's been like, "Oh my God, I'm so super progressive. I'm well, I'm basically Hillary Clinton but black this time." Cal it, California, the the blue is so deep in the government not the population the population of california is purple really but yeah. the way they have it gerrymandered into a hundred different pieces that make you know they're all made out of like fourth dimensional dohecahedrons to make it make sense <laughs> but at like yeah california might as well be a single party mm -hmm. state a single party government the way they run it here I I will say this though I would just for entertainment purposes because yes Kamala Harris I I know how you you referenced her in comparison to Hillary but Kamala Harris has more of that smart ass condescending about her I would personally just love to see her in a debate just for the hell of it with Trump just because I'm so curious to see how that would go it would like, just evolve into screaming I know I know and that's why I want to see this I want to see I, this happen I would say 
I don't want to see her get through because I don't want her to be anywhere near the presidency. No, I don't want her to be anywhere near there, but I wish we could just set it up anyways because I would love to see that. I think it would be amazing. Corey see them on Skype. But... Have a Sparta... Cory Booker would have a Spartacus moment and cry, I think. But I, I just like, I mean, I, 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 I just would, think that'd be great. I would say that, um, uh, well, uh, you know what, honestly, uh, it's starting to look like maybe Hillary Clinton is going to try to run again. Her CNN. Oh, God. Mm. Oh. Like, Everyone yeah. was saying, no, it's not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. Don't put she, anything past her. She, she might. Oh, she would insane. try. No, she may not I'll get it. You, but... I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. So um, here's the thing. Uh, well, okay. Well, for the record, if Kirsten Gillibrand was Jezebel.com, Kamala Harris would be everydayfeminism.com. Ew. <laughs> That's the only fucking difference. <laughs> not, the, <laughs> not, not the roots. <laughs> no, no, everyday feminism. Now she is she is a woke intersectional. She is a woke you know, she she don't she's not into your white feminism. But um so um but but, but Hillary what I'm thinking is this and you know uh like Hillary Clinton is the most, like maybe the most corrupt person in human history, in terms of like the amount of crooked money that she's facilitated and the amount of uh, weird connections and the amount of deaths that have happened, like um, uh, uh, under her her husband and um, you know her her, her reign as Secretary of State. Like she is just such an awful person. And then there's like the Clinton murders and everything like things that maybe she could actually definitely, definitely go down for. And the big money that is behind her undoubtedly knows just how far down she could fall if they decided to cut her to the dogs. And, but, but they still are hoping like, like Trump, Trump hates them. Trump hates the, uh, the globalist people like, you know, those Soros fuckers and, you know, like all those people, um, really, he hates them really hard. And so, um, but, but ultimately there's no, they don't have another political champion, uh, to represent, like to be their president, to represent them in the Oval Office. They simply don't. What about have Taylor them. Swift? Shut up. <laughs> they, don't, they don't have one which is why they, they don't have a champion they don't have a political champion to run and get in the old, old office which is why they had to run her in the first place and so what i really kind of think that she's doing is she's sort of telling them like look i'll, I'll figure out a way back into the white house and they're like okay well you, you better come up with a candidate and she's like i will i will i will and they're like you better come up with a candidate or we're gonna fucking kill you and and then hillary clinton is thinking to herself okay either i need to get in there myself or i'm gonna die and that's almost what like the, the level of desperation in which she was speaking to, to the cnn and just being delusional and like and you can see it in her face like she looks disturbed like she's scared of her life ending so. Was it you who said that she was Cersei Lannister? I don't know. Maybe like I, that's something. That's the kind of thing I maybe would say. Yeah, yeah, it, probably. It, it, yeah. It, it, it sounds like you. But... Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with it. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, oh my god. So, I got a question for, I guess, a question for everyone in regards to. I mean, obviously, these past couple of years have been crazy for politics. I know some. I, I know Prince. There's things that you said you saw coming and all that stuff, but. Uh, is there anyone that honestly, like, if you were to talk to a version of yourself, like, even five years ago and say this is where you will be today, politically speaking and socially speaking, this is what your perspectives will be, this is this is the side you will be on, or at least the, the side you will be supporting and who you'll be aligning yourself with, that you would have called them crazy? Because I honestly, for example, if someone had told me even two years ago that I would have had some experience work doing broadcasting on a, on a station called MAGA One Radio, that I would be now campaigning for, pushing for a libertarian candidate here in New York State, that I would be doing all these things. If someone had told me that a couple of years ago, I would have been like, you're, you're crazy, especially, or, you know, uh, all that stuff. I mean, I don't know how anyone else I don't know. Like I mean, if I was, like, high or something, which, you know, five years ago, I probably would have been. Um, <laughs> and it was, like, somebody really smart that was I was having a really cool conversation with. And they were like, yeah, do you, do you realize, like, cause you know, five years ago, that was 2013. That was when in, in San Francisco, all of my friends were starting to turn into racist lunatics. Like all of my, all of my good friends who were black were like starting to like talk about 
like microaggressions and white privilege and like you couldn't actually like like they they were all just racists they were just like brainwashed by racism by by race baiting and it mm. uh, it really negatively affected me very quickly because i was like out of all of the white people in I, I say this so much but like out of all the white people in san francisco that like was actually friends with racial minorities and a lot of them and they really really trusted i was probably like the the single most i, I was the most down man you know like i <laughs> I was like the white guy that they would invite over to the after party that, that it would be like nine black people and me. And it was like, oh, huh. It's literally all black people except for me. And like, I, I mean, that would just. Did you be- guest star on the Prince of Bel Air, Prince? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, it, you know, like, we, once, once the, the, the crap started happening in 2013, I knew something was really, really wrong. Like, I knew something was really, really wrong when, when my friends were like, trying to start problems with me on facebook and crap and like i'd be like whoa i don't know why you're hating on white people so much i mean like i can understand a lot of white people are stupid but like it's kind of divisive to and they'd be like you're divisive black people are dying in the streets and i'm like whoa like, what street <laughs> was, was it on the news i didn't see <laughs> well, no, you know, actually, when i say okay that that explicit conversation did actually happen like oh geez where, where I, but it no but it wasn't the person who said you're divisive black people are falling in the streets it was some fucking white bitch that i had never met it was like some it was like my my friend who um, isn't that how it always is <laughs> yeah no it was, some, it, was some, it was some girl my okay my, my 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 old friend who was this black girl who was like a good friend of mine she went off to go to journalism grad school at berkeley so she like moved over to berkeley and at berkeley she like made a new crew of sjw friends by like 2013 and And she became a carrier (laughs) and and um and there were these like white girls and so so cats if you could just turn down your mic volume i think that that would help a lot so um uh this girl uh she ended up my my friend the black girl she would post all these crap things about how much she hated white people and it was absurd because like all of her friends were white and they always were she she actually told me that you know uh growing up there was only like 10 or 15 other black kids in her whole school and they didn't like her because they thought that she was snobby and so like she always had mostly white friends and i was her really good friend but like I, I, she was somebody. Like I was somebody that she could talk to about how white people didn't understand what it's actually like. Like how she has to just pretend like everything's fine all the time and that she's not the only black person in the room, except for she is. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's like that with gay guys too. And like a lot of my friends growing up were uh, racial minorities who mostly hung out with black people. And I, I've I've heard about it. I know what you're talking about. And so she really appreciated that about me. And then all of a sudden she moves over to Berkeley and she's around SJWs and all she ever does is to- post about how much she hates white people. And I, I, I remember like I told her, I was like, whoa, you should maybe like not be like this publicly because, you know, there's people who haven't been crappy to you. Um, you know, maybe kind of like me, and and then some some like little white girl like who's probably an undergrad was all like, "How dare you post on that's a microaggression? You're telling her how to feel about her oppression, and you're the one who's divisive. You're the one who's divisive, and black people are dying in the streets." And 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 my friend, the black girl, said, "Oh my God, I love you so much right now." To the girl, and. Uh, yeah, and it was it was so once that shit was happening, if someone really really smart were to say, "Oh, you understand that all this crap is coming from the it's, it's coming from the top," like Obama legalized the usage of propaganda on the American people. Did you not know about that? Because it just happened a few months ago. I'd be like, "No, I didn't realize that," but that makes sense based on how my friends are acting. Oh, they'd be like, "Yeah, well, you're probably going to want to like actively campaign against the Democratic Party and like." You know, when the 2016 elections come around, uh, I guarantee you'll, you'll be actively campaigning against them. I'd be like, "Huh, I can't really believe it, but I would not entirely doubt it." <laughs> like that—that that, that would be what I would have said back then. Yeah, like I personally wouldn't. Like I, at the time, I wouldn't expect to be. Like I wouldn't expect to be like in this exact sphere because I was still in Nevada dealing with dumbass Mormons, so. I was I would expect to be more going after them because at the time I wasn't expecting to move back to California ever. 
So, but yeah, I, I, I would have expected running a YouTube channel, though, because I was already kind of thinking about it in 2013. <laughs> Even a year ago, absolutely none of this was on my radar whatsoever. Um, it was, I mean, I, I was, I've always been a Democrat. I'm like five generations Democrat. Like, I, that's just the way, you know, like my dad was a Democrat, my grandpa was a Democrat, and it, it just seemed like that was the way it was. I never grew up thinking that Republicans were particularly evil, just wrong about everything. That's that's basically how I used to think. But I never I don't remember ever fighting with anyone because they were Republican. I just grew up thinking like, oh, this is the way it is. And then Trump got elected. And I remember taking it very hard at first because my whole world was kind of shattered. I basically had I believed what these people were telling me that the world was basically ending because up to that point, I had always believed that, you know, they wanted what was best. That was just the way of things. And then I saw Antifa and Black Lives Matter rising up and the insanity. And the, and I was looking to my leaders, the people that I had trusted for basically my whole life. You know, to call out this madness, to to call for peace or order or something, and they didn't. In fact, they usually made it worse. And yeah, yeah. that that's. Uh, and then mm-hmm. I remember I just kept getting angrier and angrier and, and not understanding why. And I was watching alternative or alternative media. I was watch. I was going to. I discovered skeptic videos on YouTube, and I discovered Prince mm-hmm. and all that. And I was just like, "Ah, oh, this is interesting." And I don't know. And then before I realized it. I was really deep into it. And then I read an article on The Verge about Grindr going trance. And oh, I remember I, 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 had a, I had an embolism or something. Like I, I, I went into an altered state. I, and uh, before I knew it, I had a YouTube video um, mm-hmm. that I made on my phone. And yeah, and then I showed it to Prince. And uh, amazingly, I actually was able to get through. And here we are. <laughs> So well, it was I, a, it was quite a ride. Yeah, no, it's funny you mentioned the grinder thing because even one of my good friends, who we are good friends and we have real discussions behind the scenes, but he's one of the people who on my social media he refers to a lot of people as alt right. That I'm like, come on, you know they're not alt right. That you just disagree with them. You're calling them that so you can justify not liking them. Um, so so he's one of them, and he's watched some of my YouTube chat, you know, some of my live streams, uh, and he's he's said that with a lot of my guests. Oh, I think they're alt right. I'm like, no, but even when it came to the grinder thing even him as much as he's dealt with like the pc and it's because i think he's really close to a lot of those pc police the the far leftists he secretly said to me he's like he's like i don't get it he's like grinder for like having trans women or women in general on it he's like i what the what the hell is up with that i know he wouldn't dare say that uh, in, in in relationship to some of her other friends, because he definitely would get his head bit off. He sends me all kinds of stuff because he's Filipino. You know, he's he's half Filipino, so he's half Asian. He sends me some of the most out there stuff, making fun of other Asians because you know all the Asians hate each other. And he, he, I'm like, I dare you to post that to your Facebook, and he won't because of the PC culture that we have. He cannot be himself. He, I feel like he has. A lot of us box into different categories now in his life. There's his friends that are the uber, you know, SJW type, leftist type, and he can't really be his sarcastic asshole humor self around them too much. And then with me, he lets it all out. It's just like, oh, God, all of the jokes are just yeah. hilarious. He's, he's in the humor closet and you're his humor beard. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I got a lot of beard to go around, so you know, I got. I guess it, works. It, it. It is quite luscious, I must admit. But, but um, yeah, we the intellectual climate is just it's so repressive that regular people are starting to realize it. I mean, people, I I think everyone has sort of like kind of thought this is just the way it is for young people in particular that grew up this way. Like, I feel particularly bad for it because, I mean, like. Life is confusing as hell. And I know it's always been confusing, but it's really confusing right now with the just the sheer science fiction breakneck speed of technology. But really young people, like, actually, um, I I would say by and large, um, hate it. Um, And and it's weird, like, okay, maybe the ones who 
are in college, like who are actually at university, are largely pretty SJW, but not even mostly. Like, um, but no, but like I play video games with a lot of younger people, and like they are so not interested in the politics. And like I have to remember what I was like at that time. Like it's exhausting to even have any idea what these people are even talking about. You know, like what ex like. Seriously, I'll talk to people who are like 20 and they're like, so you talk a lot about feminism on your, because I'm like, we, these are people I play video games with, right? And so you would think that like a 20 year old kid like knows about feminism and they're like, so you talk about feminism? I mean, because like, I'm in favor of equality, like totally, <laughs> but I, I Cats, you really got to turn down your fucking microphone. Bacon, can you, like, turn his... It's, it's driving me fucking crazy. It's, like, this, like, this constant scratching thing. And, um, and to me, it sounds like a heavy predator breathing. It's like... <sighs> <sighs> <laughs> so, um, and, and, and if, if I'm getting annoyed, the audience is getting annoyed. When I had you on my channel that, at the time a few months ago, um, granted, you were in your car, so there was, like, wind and stuff, but, like, there was people who left me comments saying, like, oh, I can't get through this. The audio is so bad. So, like, it's a thing. you, you got to work on that. So, um, uh, the thing about um, – I'll, I'll be playing with people, and they will say things like, oh, well, I'm in favor of equality, but, I mean, so you're, like, not a feminist, and I'm, like – no, I absolutely am not a feminist. I can't stand feminists. I've made well over 100 videos talking about how feminists are essentially like the worst people on earth right now. And they're like, oh, okay. Yeah, because that's sort of what I thought. Like, I mean, like they say that they're all about equality, but like they just, all they do is talk about how men are horrible. And it's really, dumb. that's what it seems like. But like, I mean, but you don't dislike women. I'm like, no, of course not. Like we have female friends that we play games with and he's like okay that's what i thought oh cool um wait okay hold on i'm gonna smoke some pot because our match is about to start like that's that's what you know like they're they're actually like um and it, it, it you know like the small but vocal minority of people um it's not it's mostly not really young people it really is mostly people in who are the people who are on like facebook or and and um on twitter and everything i would say they're mostly people like around the ages of in their early 30s or so who are really spending a Ooh. lot of time doing it and and then there's like these like you know mothers who are like in their late 30s and early 40s who like kind of get in on it because they're you know like they grew up as feminists in the 90s or whatever like kind of like i did <laughs> with around my stupid ass environment um but they don't really know much about it. Um, and then there's like all these, but, but then th there's the population of professional leftist blogger type people, like the, uh, the Lindy Wests of the world, who the only thing that they've ever had going for them was being offended by things and writing stupid articles for like Vox or Salon or Everyday Feminism or, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and they make a whole lot of noise and they have a whole lot of friends on social media and they and they terrorize everybody else. And it, it, it is this small um I don't even know how I got down this, but okay, okay. <laughs> this is what I'm gonna say. Um it's easy, it's really, really easy for us mm -hmm. being this age to think like, oh my God, it must be so hard on the young people. The young people aren't even hardly aware of it. They have like 200 friends on Facebook and they're, I'm the only one that they know who even talks about this stuff. They talk about literally like video games and like, okay, I have one female friend that I play video games with regularly and she's like, she says, I, I don't know if this started as, like, I don't know. I think that if this sort of started as a result of me, um, but she seriously sits there and she calls people cunts a lot. Like, she's like, ah, oh, yeah, god damn it, you cunt. And like, when she dies and stuff, you know, like, oh, fucking, he came up from behind the cunt, you know, and shit like that. Like, that's what she's like. And she plays basketball in real life. And she, she, um, goes to university for, um, she, she had been 
she's been doing visual art stuff. Um, she she hasn't finished, and but she's going into. Um, she wants to go into uh, a particular. I think it's like integrated computer design. Um, it's the kind of thing that if you study this and you major in it, then you could go into game design, and that's what she probably wants to go into. And she's really smart. She's good at games. Um, she's not a feminist. Like she, I mean, she she knows what my channel is. Like she could. We've been playing video games for months and months and months and months. I don't know how many of my videos she's actually watched. Uh, her sister is, I think, a bit of a feminist, but she's not. And um, yeah, you know, like it, a lot of young people are more like her. And no. we just don't hear from them because all we do is talk about the culture war. But like they have this whole world of like playing video games and crap. That's what I'm saying. Uh, uh, to, be, uh, to, to be honest, I was uh, to be honest, I actually wasn't even talking about um, so much the culture war as just social media and the ubiquity of everything you say and everything you think being measured and being preserved forever. Because that's new. No one's ever had that before. And we do a lot of dumb things when we're little. And it's going to be interesting and kind of heartbreaking, I think, for a lot of these people to have to deal with the permanent record of their childhood, considering how scientifically we tend to go over things now compared to the past. Yeah, yes and no. But, um, okay, actually, Benjamin Boyce came up, came up with a really, really great, um, uh, like, it was a tweet. And um, I, I want to remember the exact wording. It was, the irony of our time is that everything is recorded for eternity but lost in infinity mm. and that's i think a really good way to describe it and the other thing to keep in mind is that um once people are have something that they grow up with that they've always had it just becomes a part of their life and so you know kids kids see a, a viral video of like a, there was this thing on facebook um some mom, some some daughter, like a teenage girl, some black girl, s s cut class, and her mom made a sign out of a cardboard box, and it said, um, I cut class, and I'm going to be standing on the corner in 10 years just like this. Unless I unless I sort myself out or some shit like that, and 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 the, and the mom put her on a corner like on, on a, like a busy intersection and took a picture of her and she's like crying, and uh, the person was like trying to have a debate like oh is this cool to do this to your kids blah 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 and and my argument was like well but I think that that's a perfectly actually a fair thing to do as a punishment in the digital world because it's not like kids don't got cell phones like. Would it, okay, which is worse? She gets caught cutting class and her mom does that to her or she cuts class and then gets in a fight with some other girl that gets uploaded onto YouTube and then there's this one of these like videos of some teenage girls literally like, you know, clawing each other and crap because that happens a lot. You know, like which is worse, and like um, and 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 kids grow up knowing that both things could happen. They go out, they get in a fight, it gets recorded, the whole internet sees it. Like they, you know, if they win, maybe that's cool. If they lose, that is one of the worst things ever. Uh, similarly, if they get in trouble with their parents, their parents might take an embarrassing picture, upload it to the internet. That's a part of kids now, and it will shape how they are with the world, how they behave them, how, how they how they are honestly. And um, it, it's just things change, but, you know, like, it's, uh, we've, I, we, we're getting used to it. The kids are even more used to it. I mean, I can agree with that, that the kids really, honestly, the younger generation, even early 20s, they're just not there in the same in the same, um, you know, space in the same mindset. Uh, I know I think I've talked with you about this before, Prince, but one of my friends, we were having a party for him. We were going to some event at his house and his younger sister happened to be visiting and she just turned 21 uh, a few months earlier. So it was her first time getting a drink with her big brother, and he's closer to my age. Uh, he's in his early 30s. I think he just turned 30. And uh, he is one of the types where I uh, – he's the one that I mentioned who uh, at last Pride, he showed up wearing a shirt that said queer, but the word queer was the sickle and the hammer. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he's, he's one with that. And he and I were having a discussion at this party about the distinction between a liberal and a leftist. And he and I were going back and forth and his sister oh, chimed in, his sister chimed in and she's like, 
aren't those the same thing though a liberal and the left isn't the left liberal and stuff and we both looked at her and we're like nah we're having so so she just was completely disconnected from this and he and i are having this conversation about that distinction between a liberal a leftist and you know being middle of the aisle a moderate and we're going back and forth and she was just completely detached from it so yeah yeah like yeah, I, like, well like the college that i went to like i went to a public university in the bay area for the last couple of years of my degree there were thirteen thousand people in my university do you want to guess how many of them were actual hardcore you know feminist types a very small percentage to be honest like two or three hundred out of thirteen thousand Hmm. Well, that was actually kind of a lot because well, 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 well out of thirteen thousand in, in yeah, the area, yeah. that's like not yeah even, yeah yeah that's less than a rounding yeah. we we only had a few really um obvious ones mm -hmm. in my college but my my college wasn't even a thousand people it was very small like fucking private school um and uh <laughs> it's funny I mean there were definitely like the random feminist people that I didn't really realize were feminists because they didn't go to the little like hardcore like Marxist meetings. But then they would say these like this one girl was definitely a feminist and I think that she must have been abused. Um and she had issues. She was fucking weird. And one time she went on this kind of like ramble in class where she was like, Well, and I think that, you know, some feminist the theorists have theorized that like the, the 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 cause of male sexual violence is, is pornography and and i really think that that's tr tr true and, and blah 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 and it's like oh my god says the girl who's like hasn't even lost her virginity probably at like 20 like you know um i don't even want to say there's cobwebs up there it's more like fucking super glue like you're insane like i would you know there's no way that like you have any idea what ma male sexual violence is about like i've i've been in like three writing classes with you you're a wacko um well, I don't and really masturbate so there's that <laughs> but um, <laughs> but 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 even at that school it was like most of us we I mean, and this was in you know i went there from 2000 through 2004 and this is like the new school university which was what um uh anita sarkeesian what they gave anita sarkeesian an honorary degree at and um so you would think that there would have been like a whole lot more but there wasn't really like i, I it's, it's like there's some some kids like kind of get into this stuff but i really think it's mostly like it's mostly the bloggers and the adjunct professor professors and for, for them it's like this like weird career opportunity thing and a lot of them probably don't even really believe it I don't even think anyone really believes it. I don't think anyone, that was my whole point of my Sargon video, the, the why they won't debate us. The whole point of it was that even the people that are supposedly true believers, like the cat blacks of the world, they don't believe it. She's just a con. <laughs> I haven't even watched a video of hers even just to see what's going on with that hot mess in a long time. It's it's probably been almost a year. Well, no, she doesn't, she, doesn't even, no, she doesn't really make videos. Oh, she doesn't anymore. Oh, okay. No, I know her um teachers. You know how she was like a YouTube teacher's pet. Okay, I don't know if you knew this, yeah. but she, she was like a YouTube teacher's pet. She would like meet with YouTube headquarters. She probably actually knew personally Susan Wojcinski. She was at panels at VidCon. Um, at some point, they actually like flagged one of her videos, and she did a whole rant like "fuck YouTube," and she stopped making content on her main channel. She'd upload rants to her side channels just because, like, she's cat black. She doesn't have a life outside of video sharing. Um, but yeah, I don't know what she's doing for money. Maybe uh, making weaves with Rachel Doazal or something. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm definitely out of the loop. Well, that actually brings me to a question for you guys. Have you guys ever had your point? Because I think part of it is, is honestly, it's exhausting. It really, it really is. And there's this uh, burnout, especially when you jump into it, regardless of what side you're jumping into, um, you know, the political arena or social arena. There is this, uh, there is this burnout. I know when I first became an activist, that was one of the warnings was find things outside of what you're doing here or else you will burn out. Um, and it, it contributed a little bit to why I stepped away personally, even from my YouTube and from what I was doing. Has anyone else really had that, like at least that thought? I know you haven't done it, but have you had that thought of, okay, I might take a little bit of a break. I need to step back. This is just, yeah, just too much. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I quit drinking because um, I was, I was just all I was doing was drinking and watching YouTube videos and drinking, and watching and getting all mad and remember, and then I, it, yeah. eventually I was like, I was burning out, and then I quit drinking and I went through the like few months of like depression that happens with you if you're drinking heavily for a while, um, and then I, uh, then I took up video games and got really into uh, team video games in particular, uh, Overwatch. I, 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 there's a few other. I should get into Fortnite because Fort, uh, and I should get into maybe uh, Destiny because um, those are both games that you can play with your friends, um, and I have friends that play it. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, no, um, it, 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 it's, and it's cool because you know, like video games, it completely dissociates you from. Uh, the culture worry warrior stuff like you just um, you it's like you forget that you even were just talking about feminism and gay guys an hour ago you know <laughs> entirely so yeah works for me uh, outlet outlet is important which by the way I, I, I don't know if anyone would be interested I think it would be awesome to do a where are they now kind of stream as far as the, the YouTubers that we watched like crazy or we felt at least got us kind of involved in where are they now and what are they doing whether whether they got us involved because they pissed us off or whether they got our interest because we agreed with them I, I just think that would be an interesting, <laughs> interesting you could have a whole channel devoted to uh, where are the YouTubers now there's not exactly a limited supply Oh no, no, I know, I know, but <laughs> this would be something, something. So, so, a question for you guys, uh, because I uh, mind you, I, I I came in a little bit later. I don't know if this has been covered by you guys already, but um, have you seen that Brett Barr article that recently has been going around a little bit more um, about the young kid who was falsely accused by five teenage girls of uh, sexual assault? He actually did a little bit in um, in like. Uh, I think it was a couple weeks. He was in like a detention center. He was a lifeguard. He was accused of sexual assault by a girl. Uh, then another girl came forward saying sexual assault. And it turned out after he was put through so much, lost his job. Uh, and uh, he was, you know, he was an, on house arrest. He, the, at one point, the most he could do was go out and mow the lawn. And then eventually it came out that they lied. And the girl admitted it was called like the mean girl thing. The girl admitted to lying because she just wanted him expelled from school. Yeah, I heard about that. It's, it, it's, it's awful beyond words. This is one of those reasons why I think they should suffer the same consequences as um, actual rapists. Oh, I could devise a very appropriate punishment. Um, one of the yeah, it, with spikes in it? No, no, no. You know me. I, I like to use my medical degree and be a little bit more creative. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> a, a mercury enema. That would be interesting. <laughs> That's, I should, I should actually research that. But yeah, I'm pretty sure like, you know, being poisoned through your ass is uh, a pretty bad way to go. <laughs> and, uh, that is definitely something that I wouldn't mind happening to those girls. Um, no, I shouldn't say that, but you know, yeah, don't make me hate it's, is oh yeah. god what, well, well exactly what isn't hate speech right now i know but still i don't i don't want to it's leave like, my streaming i don't want to go to my second yeah, channel yeah. true that's it's like that um the fake academic things that you know the the three that pulled that giant beautiful hoax and one of the faux articles that they did was about how whatever well, there was that, but I thought the most interesting one that no one's really talking too much about was the one where they tried to say that guys masturbating about girls without their consent was a form of psychic rape. <laughs> oh my God! Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> that that's really oh, right up too. there. I mean, the fact the fact that I bet you a lot of people were like, "Ooh, that's juicy." I mean, it's just like, it, it, like the go, fuck uh, subconscious bias. Like, yeah, sure. so, so question, how would that go, by the way, to ask someone for their permission to masturbate about them? I mean, would you go to like... Badly, I would think. If it's a celebrity, would you go to like, I don't know, their channel or something? Like you write them a letter? Uh, well, you'd have to purchase a <laughs> masturbation license fee. Like I imagine you could uh, okay. buy uh, I imagine you could buy them from their website and they'd probably accept PayPal. <laughs> it's it's like an oh. ebook. But, but have you ever wanted to masturbate about Pamela Anderson? Like, well, go to her website right now, download the code, and begin the greatest night of your life. Oh, I actually forgot who Pamela oh. Anderson was. 
I know. <laughs> God, I feel so old. But... Uh, yeah. I know who she is. And I'm just like, wow, that's right. She's a person. I know yeah. when was the last time she was in anyone's mind, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I, I think there's a I think there's a part of her that will always be in people's mind. Me. The silicone. <laughs> <laughs> you should, you know, I, I I don't know, but it's it's funny because I just, I just picked her because she was like such a really huge thing when I was growing up. Even even though I of course wasn't interested at all. I mean, it was impossible to avoid her, like or her yeah. breasts. And um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And then I saw this weird documentary about her at post sex tape when she was like up being a mom or something. And it's weird. It was like the first time I was thinking like, huh, I don't hate this person. She's kind of dumb, but I don't hate her. But so, so like, so, is there a loophole in this though? I, I gotta have a question. I got a question for that though. Is there a loophole? Like, for example, um, if you have to ask a celebrity or ask someone to <laughs> masturbate them, like, if, 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 if masturbate about them. So let's use Pamela Anderson, right? So there's the actress is who she is. But what if you say, well, I'm, what if a guy were to say, well, I'm masturbating to the character that she played? Is there a distinction there? <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> I mean, where where are we going with this? Like, wait, wait, wait. Two 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 things about um, Pamela Anderson. One was that there was like the Borat uh, part with her was was quite funny. She, oh yes, yeah. He like decided to throw the sack over her or whatever. And then um, <laughs> also the the most the best Pamela Anderson thing of all time. Like if if you like want to actually sort of enjoy her was when they roasted her she wrote she wrote a book like some sort of autobiography or something and um when they released the autobiography book they had a roasting of Pam- pamela anderson and they had mm. a number of her close personal friends they had that fucking rock star like tommy lee or whatever that she was married yeah. to the guy with the like 11 inch dick or whatever and um uh, I which I've still never seen a naked picture of him. I should really want that. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, um, they had the I think the MC or at least one one of the people there was the comedian Eddie Griffith, um, who was a little black guy. Do you guys know who that is? I remember him, but yes, uh... he, he was he was like a funnier version of Kevin Hart, kind of that was a little bit ruder, um, like. He, like, I don't know. He he wasn't. He was. He's, he's kind of different. Kevin Kevin Hart is weird. But um. So uh, Eddie Griffith was. Oh, and then the other person who was there, uh, and this was this was who I didn't know this, but apparently was like is is Pamela Anderson's like best friend is Courtney Love. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> they're apparently like besties and that was just so strange yeah and um courtney love was actually a really really funny like her whole speech about like that she gave was really funny and the best moment of the whole thing was um like um eddie griffin was talking for some reason like he i think he was emceeing i don't remember he was saying something and courtney love started interrupting and and he was like chill girl and she's like oh whatever why don't you got to have me get arrested and he was like maybe and, and she's like oh whatever or no 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 that's not how it went it was okay he said something about black people or something and she like yelled from the side like from across stage she was like oh yeah i know all about black people I, i've been to jail and he just stops and looks like awkwardly and he's like yeah, and we all know you need to go back. And that was the best moment of the whole thing. So I messed it up. I ruined it. I ruined the show. <laughs> my my, my personal so. my personal favorite moment was when B. Arthur read an excerpt from uh, not I, I think it was from either the from that particular book or some other where uh, Pamela Anderson's very crudely. Uh, constructed character asked her gay best friend about anal sex and how it works and B. Arthur just read it with this complete straight face deadpan and I just remember, that's all she really did was just read the book and like, everyone was just falling over dying because everything B. Arthur does or did was just amazing 
My fa- my personal favorite Pamela Anderson moment is actually a really small one, but it's um it's a dear part of my heart. It was on Futurama when they were trying to get Fry's bank account uh, to blackmail him. Mom Corp was, and Pamela Anderson was talking to him, and. He, he didn't recognize she said he doesn't know i'm in a movie like you were in a movie it was the first movie to be filmed entirely in slow motion <laughs> it's just one line but it it just it really it just makes me smile the the just the idea of like pamela anderson and the cast of baywatch trapped in a slow motion movie yeah, can you imagine sitting in a slow motion movie for like an hour and a half two hours <laughs> it, would be, it would be the most it'd be like big Trapped inside a lava lamp or something. That's when you'd, that's when you'd have to get high for that one. I was gonna say that would be one of the better stoner opportunity stoner movies right there. I, I I don't know if they make drugs strong enough for that. To be honest, I mean like just straight slow motion, no pauses, no breaks. I mean at a certain point, even stoners get bored. <laughs> that's, when they, that's when they start eating Chinese food. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine, especially if they tried to do it like it was just a normal movie, but it was done in slow motion. So, like, it's all these regular scenes are happening. Like, they, you know, they go to the coffee shop and they're pouring the milk, but the milk is pouring in slow motion. And then you see her ordering and like telling a joke. <laughs> it's the mouth movements are all super slow. Oh, <laughs> uh, God. So I think of strange for, things. So, question for everyone Who thinks. How, who has a prediction for the morning of November 7th? Do you think there's going to be a lot of heads exploding? Do you think there's yeah. going to be a lot of tears? That's a given. Oh, yeah. No matter what happens, yeah. it'll Because yeah. that's heads what happens now. Heads, people, like, people are going to be having exploding heads. People are going to be shitting themselves. People are going to be screaming and vomiting. And all manner of, <laughs> all manner of fluids and noises and emotions will be involved. And I'll be there to clean it up, unfortunately. Uh, oh god uh, does, uh, you know for the first time ever there might actually be a a waiting line like do you have an appointment <laughs> but you actually have to start making reservations to go to a safe space like oh i like that one. Oh, I, thought was, I was just gonna ask i mean to vote for your head to explode in public <laughs> <laughs> so taking reservations for head exploding at six uh, you, I'm so, California actually outlawed that particular kind of uh, uh, rage. It's not covered under your plan. Mm. Mm. Do you think there's going to be any shakeups? That uh, what shakeups do you think are going to happen that are going to be unexpected? I mean, I know in my home state, I'm hoping for there to at least be a message sent. I don't know if it's necessarily going to be a big shakeup, uh, but I am hoping for a message to be sent in, in regards to the election. But right now, to be I'm honest, hoping, it, right now I'm hoping Gavin Newsom loses. That's all I oh God! Yeah, that would. That's really the only hope in California that you have for any kind of realistic change. I don't know if people realize just how completely stratified California is in terms of the way the Democratic Party has cut it up. I mean, even if you like the Democrats, at a certain point, like even if you are a Democrat, it's still kind of disturbing when you have an entire state that has been literally drawn to be a certain way. I mean, it's like feudalism. Yeah, yeah you get to. What, what, are the, one of the things that's really strange that I was just realizing about um, California is that – so one of the things that people don't really realize is how many untapped resources there are in California in terms of um, things like oil that they could dig for in national parks, and um, they don't. <laughs> like uh and um just like the, the environmentalism standards that are in california are like really really high uh but then they also have organizations like greenpeace and stuff which are heavily tied to the democratic party and apparently that's one of the big reasons why texas and california hate each other is because they um like texas utilizes the natural resources that are in Texas and California doesn't, and they have this whole environmentalism industry and that, that puts them at odds with each other. And it's strange to think about how like the democratic party potentially acts as like these gatekeepers of making it so that people aren't using the, the natural resources. Now, granted, I don't know much about 
that. I was just hearing about it recently um, because I, um, being somebody that lives in San Francisco, I actually knew a lot of people that worked in like environmental. And there are there are idiots, dude. They are so dumb. All of these people. Um, I I think. Oh, go ahead. But um, it's interesting to think that like there's people who you know their full time job is to get these like seeming bullshit pseudoscience we're gonna save the world like tree hugger degrees from places like um berkeley and uh you know green urban planning and stuff that like i don't know what they use those degrees for aside from ending up as some sort of bureaucrat for the democratic party and that by itself might be its own system there is yeah there is definitely an industry a cottage industry i think you would call it like of people that work in certain fields like that um i think the biggest problem in california it is true there is just it's not so much the environmentalism of california because conserving the environment is always a good idea mm. it's just the way that you do it it's what mm. and that is a big problem but that's not the biggest constraint on business in california i i really believe that the biggest constraint for business in California is just the sheer amount of cronyism that there is in California. Like if you don't pay and play well with the establishment, it's very difficult for a business to actually operate in California without being just completely decimated by just layers upon layers of regulations and weird like things that don't even make sense. Like in California, if you, as I understand it, if you as a business in a sanctuary city, for instance, cooperate with ICE or do that, you can be like, that's a crime, actually. And it's like, okay, that's really strange. That doesn't make mm. any sense. And a lot of businesses don't like to behave that way. I mean, for God's sakes, they just, they just passed a law saying that any business registered in California has to have like a certain percentage of women on their uh, shareholders board or whatever, like the board of directors. And it's like that alone is going to kill California because mm -hmm. no business wants to have the more regulations you put on the kind of people that a business can use. It doesn't even matter whether it's men, women, black, white, or brown, you're putting a constraint on the talent pool. And that's a, at a high level where there is a very small number of people that are actually even mm. able to do that kind of work. And when you make it so that it has to be a woman, just because there aren't necessarily that many at that level, because they, not because women can't do it, but because, you know, they got other shit to do half the time when they get to that level, you're, you're going to make it to where businesses don't want to behave, don't want to be here because it's going to be too difficult and too expensive mm -hmm. and just too much of a pain in the ass. We lost North Face, for God's sakes. I mean, they started here in the Bay Area and they went to Colorado, because even though they've been here since the 70s, because who the fuck wants to do business in California anymore? Mm -hmm. Tesla, Google, <laughs> Alphabet, and that's about it. I have to agree with one thing, though, in regards to the environmentalists, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting, though, because, I mean, it gets it gets uh, associated a lot with the left and Democrats and everything. But it's interesting how many uh, conservative leaning uh, it is actually more politically diverse than people think. For example, a large number of hunters are very much involved uh, as environmentalists in regards to preserving the land that they hunt on so that it can exist for generations to come. So yeah, stewardship. I actually, yeah, I, th I think, you know, the, the environmentalism is a lot more politically diverse than people are aware. Uh, but yeah, I agree in the, many of the other areas, uh, like here in, in New York State, it's actually a huge issue. And it's actually more bipartisan than people realize where the conflict rises is in other issues such as gun control and, and you know, other taxes and stuff like that. But, but what I wonder is, can you hunt in the, national, or in the, in the parks in, in uh, California? Um, I think you can in some states. Um, and you have to have a, a license, obviously. There's mm. hunting isn't really, as far as I know, hunting isn't actually an issue in California because that's usually a county level decision, and the counties that have hunting are usually very much in favor of that. I don't. I mean, no, California has a very active outdoor culture. I don't think that's. I don't, I don't think that's really where 
you get into a problem. Like environmentally, as far as like the biggest problem people have is like being unable to cut down trees on their own on their property, depending where their property is or what kind it is, because of you know a certain regulation or having a not being able to redivert a river even though it's your land because it goes into something else and you have to get it cleared and someone has to come out and measure mm -hmm. it. And, you know, it's a big bureaucratic mess. Their hearts are in the right place. It's not inherently a bad idea to have a level of management involved in this kind of thing, but a lot of it has to do with mostly it just being incredibly bureaucratic and inept, like the, which is the biggest other problem that no one really talks about in California. It's just the sheer size of our state bureaucracy. I mean, the, California has taken this idea of being kind of like a separate country, you know, like the whole Calexit thing, Calexit. Yeah, it's it's definitely a pipe dream. It'll never happen. But the fact that there is a significant number of the population that actually think it's a good idea. And I'm not talking about the whole like, you know, every state has their separatist movements. But in California, the separatists actually think that it's. It's like an idea that a lot of pe regular mainstream people actually kind of flirt with, even though they don't necessarily talk about it. Because California, no, yeah, it's twisted. It's twisted. Yeah, I mean, like California, they've taken all the stuff that's good about California. Like, you know, we have the wine industry, we have the movie industry. I mean, you know, did you know that the California state economy is bigger than the state of Italy? Uh, that's the biggest. Uh, it's, it's the fucking. It's like it's 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 it's, 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 it's as big. It's about as big as how however many women get raped on university campuses. Like, I, 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 like how do you even like? How do they calculate what is the biggest – like, what does that even mean exactly? Well, like, like, well no, I mean, it, it makes I, I know, sense. I but... know how they're calculating it, and yeah. it's bullshit. It's fraudulent. The majority of – like, the biggest, the biggest portion of it is property. It's just fucking property, and that's because there's massively inflated property values that's dependent upon people wanting to live there for uh, – entertainment and for um uh climate uh climate and and um for uh tech tech work and stuff like there's there's specific reasons why people but they don't they wouldn't always necessarily want to and the, there's so many fucked up things about that like also the fact that china um like China has been building in California massively, and China is wanting to overtake the West. They're starting to expand military bases into this Pacific, and they're they're starting to get more and more intense with the trade wars and stuff. And a lot of people are are really suspecting that they're actually thinking that they are going to try to become more of um the international superpower within the next fifty years. And that we, we might see a world war, like an actual serious, like weird world war that is unlike anything we've ever seen because it will be probably mostly fought with like weird, I don't know, drones and crap. Um, and it will be... Uh, Cyber warfare will be huge. It already is happening all the time. Yeah, and it and will it, become and, more dramatic. And it will happen. They're, they're, they're thinking it's going to happen. Um, Black Pigeon Speaks made a video called uh china 2040 or something like that and uh, he's saying it's around that time when it's when the when the conflict's going to get really thick i um, love his videos he has such a twisted and really insightful brain yeah he's he's pretty interesting um i i i have to say i um he he's interesting he's interesting he he he, he, he doesn't structure himself as well as he used to and i hate that stupid like sound effect like that classical thing that he uses to, like in in between like like once every um you know 500 words or whatever it's just like uh dude why do you do that but um still he is very very smart um so yeah and it's annoying it's annoying that he gets um lumped in with the alt-right crowd and everything because i don't think that he's like an ideologue and i don't think that he's uh, attempting to like actually really um I, I think that he gets lumped in with that because he he does talk about some points that they like to talk about and he's not overtly critical of them and well, he is yeah yeah well yeah the thing the, it's it's I think I would say more like this 
the things that he talks about, which are like factual, are things that the alt right can or is is pieces of information that the alt right can weaponize for their own agenda. But the things that he says are just kind of like largely undisputedly true like when every time i watch that 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 video about how how women lead to the collapse of civilizations it's like freaky yeah it's like i don't see i don't see how this is not true (laughs) like that's how i feel it's very hard to argue with um like and that's to me the sign of a really good content where you feel yourself kind of like conflicted about it but you can't is immediately say why of it, and then you have to ask yourself why you feel that way and it's just it's it's very head trippy and insightful and i like it yeah yeah well um yeah i also did set the stream to end around 10 just because well oh that's fine because i actually yeah. i want to get some work done tonight because i want oh, cool. to do my kanye video so we'll just have it's a 1 a.m uh, for me okay <laughs> We'll have a shortish stream tonight, and uh, I will talk to you guys later. Okay. So, um, any uh, last words before we, um, before I kill everything? Um, let's let me see. Uh, uh, I um, oh, guys, um, look for uh content um from uh people like the Liberal Hammer that will be hosted on the Gatriarchy while we can't have live streams uh such as his gig tau video that he's he he promised i he promise promised. i will make it i will make it i promise you, i will make you, it you must enrich the collective <laughs> imagine imagine um um i'm um i'm gamora and thanos has captured me and you're chris pratt your star lord you promised. You told me. Well, well, if you were, well, who am I? Am I the raccoon in all this? Then yeah. I, I are. Some, I am. Uh, maybe. maybe. Uh, I, I'm the cat. I'm the cat with cybernetic armor strapped to its. No, I think, I think that you're. Um, um, I think that you're Drax. Drax. Oh yeah. God! Oh yeah. God! Why? Oh on God! Because you have an odd, odd sense of humor. It it is true. I do, but well, uh, at least at least I'm I think, I, think I would I think I would be the fucking raccoon, fucking terms of attitude. <laughs> yeah, you know what? You're right. You you are an exploding raccoon. I I, I give you that. Okay, so on that note, I'm gonna end the stream. We have uh, our cat is Drax. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Bye.